Good evening and welcome to Christian Conversation. We hope that you will enjoy this different scenery. For this show, we have normally been in the office, but in the studio, but we decided that we wanted to share with you, our audience, the beauty of what God is doing here at Shepherd's Haven on Howard Street in Chadburn, North Carolina. So you've heard us talk about it a lot. So we just wanted to share the setting with you and let you get an idea of how beautiful things really are. You can enjoy the birds. Uh, you can endure the cars. You can um, catch me watching every now and then because right now there's a big hawk flying around. And uh, so, but just enjoy the show tonight because we want you to enjoy what God has given us here at Shepherd's Haven. I want to talk about something tonight that's a little bit different than um, I had planned on, but it just kind of crept up on me. And I'll tell you, I, I like to be somewhat transparent, maybe not totally, but I was in a service yesterday and I heard a pastor speaking about something that I had never read this scripture before and it really uh, triggered something inside of me. Um, you know, when you get in the middle of something like we're doing here, it's very easy to get weary. Uh, it's very easy to run out of gas. It's very easy to even get frustrated or impatient or uh, even a little angry every once in a while because you really don't know why things aren't happening fast enough. And um, so this message last night came out of the book of 1 Corinthians, but to keep it in context, I want to tell you just a little bit about the context because I'm learning that the context of where the scripture was tended to be has as much to do with what it says as, as anything else. So Paul wrote this letter to the church at Corinth. This was his first of two letters to the church at Corinth. And he's telling them um, about all the things that he wants them to be aware of and to focus on and to pay attention to. Uh, he said that, for instance, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And as you know, they were so focused on baptism that they were missing the message of the gospel many times. And and so this whole um, book is about instructions and, and uh, lessons that they needed to learn. But this scripture that was read yesterday to me by Brad Carter, and um, I went over to um, uh, his radical praise to a meeting, and Brad brought a powerful message, and, and I just left him to preach. But I want to read to you from the 16th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. And this is where Paul is telling them that he has plans for travel. And I want you to listen carefully to the language that's used here. This is from the um, English Standard Version. You can read it in many other versions. I think it's all about the same. But beginning in verse 5, he says, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia. So he's basically letting them know. And there, if you remember now, all of this communication is by letter. There's no phones. There's no Pony Express. There's no pigeons. This is all in letters. So who knows how long it was that he wrote this before. He said, but I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I have intentions of passing that way. And perhaps I will even stay with you and spend the entire winter so that you may help me with my journey wherever I go. Now, you could stop there and talk about, was he going to raise money like a missionary? Was he going there to rest? Was he going there to build a church? Who knows? But anyway, in verse 7 it says, For I do not want to see you now just in passing. In other words, he feels like he needs to spend enough time with them to teach them some things that he feels like they need to learn. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. So on the calendar, of religious calendar, um, on our calendar, Pentecost is right around the corner um, in the near future. But here he says, I'm going to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, after Pentecost. For a wide door of effective work has been opened to me. So this is where this story gets really interesting. Because he's telling them, I want to come. I'm, co I'm coming your way. I don't want to just stop. I want to spend some time with you 
I want to teach you some things. You can help me as I'm helping you. And he says, I want to come after Pentecost. And then it says, for a wide door of effective work has opened for me, comma, but there are many adversaries. Now, I've never read that before. So in my life, in my ministry, our ministry, we feel like that God has opened up a wide door of effective work. And he's opened that door before us and given us a privilege to do something incredible. That is generational value. This is not just about my life. This is about 100 years from now or 50 years from now. or ever, As long as there's a need for pastors to be restored, as long as there's pastors, are going to be need to be restored. I can promise you that. Um, but there's, there's a couple of things that we mentioned last night that I think merit me sharing with you and i want to share these things with there's three areas that we need to be guarded against or labeled as adversaries um we would like to think that the adversary is the devil and he is he's a he's a very strong adversary we would like to think that it's maybe another denomination we would like to think maybe it's something else or something else but these three things um are going to sort of sh rack, sh shake you just a little bit because they certainly did me the first thing that i think we need to guard against as an adversary is the spirit of popularity now let me give you a couple of examples that were shared last night a few years ago every church wanted to have a coffee shop they wanted to some of them had starbucks some of the megachurches at Starbucks. Everybody wanted their own coffee shop. Then everybody wanted a welcome center with a coffee shop. And then everybody wanted a lounge area with a coffee shop. And then everybody wanted a cafe with a coffee shop. And you can go to these churches, and the trend has become that you can go to church, have breakfast, um, sit and rest, uh, read the newspaper, go to church, and have lunch, and... You know, that's just, that's been a trend, a fad. And what's happened is, is so many churches have seen it work somewhere else, and they think that is, is if I do that, it's going to work for us. Whatever's popular may not be what God's called you to do or called us to do. Now, I would like to tell you that my hope and my desire would be that I could pick up the phone tomorrow after God sends us a, a, a bountiful resource and call a general contractor and say, come finish, I'm going to go to the beach, and when you get through, give me a call, and I'll come back, and we'll be done. That's kind of the trend that how these things happen. Everybody says to me, why don't you hire somebody? And I say, why don't you send somebody? You know, it, so the, the popularity adversary is is we end up trying to do what others are doing that may be working for them, but it's not working for everybody. Another good illustration of this is there's a, there's a huge push in the evangelical church about nine seconds after somebody pulls in your parking lot, they decide if they're coming back or not. Nine seconds. That's how convenient parking was. Did somebody open the door for them? Did somebody greet them with an umbrella? Did somebody smile and say good morning with a clown suit on? These are popular, popular trends that show us that we can do certain things because it worked in California, but it doesn't necessarily work in South Carolina or North Carolina. So we have to guard very intently about against the adversary of popularity. Another thing, I'm just using some that was mentioned. You know, 20 years ago, um, you if, if I was preaching 20 years ago, I'd have on a coat and tie, and I would have my shoes shined, and you know, everybody would know that when I walked in the door that I was the minister because I looked like him. I had my Bible in my hand, and I had my tie and everything on. And that was, that became just kind of the norm. However, Popularity now has it where ministers are wearing their baseball caps backwards. Um, they're wearing shorts, flip-flops. 
um, whatever they're doing, and it, and and people are saying, well, if their church is growing so fast, maybe I should try that. But that may not be what God wants you to do. God may have called you to do something different. So I want to remind you and guard you against the adversary of popularity. Jesus was not popular. I want to tell you, everywhere he went, there was somebody after him. There was an adversary somewhere. From day one to the very last day, there was an adversary. So it's not important what's popular. It's more important about what God wants us to do. The second adversary is preservation. Now, this one gets a little hairy and a little controversial with a lot of Pentecostals. Um, because what happens is, is we think that, well, great-grandmama did it this way. That's the way we're going to do it. And we're not changing. We're not taking the stained glass windows out. We're not getting rid of the hymnals. We're not doing this. We're not doing this. And so we get hung up on an adversary of preservation. We want to make monuments of those who came before us. And our focus should be making a monument out of the one who died for us. So I think it's very dangerous for us to try to drag our traditions along with us. I, I'm going to say this, and some of you that watch us may shatter when I say this. Some of our traditions were not in the best interest of the kingdom. Some of the things that great-grandma did worked for great-grandma, but we're not working the 20th century, 21st century. Regardless of whether you like it or not, times have changed. I know what you're going to say. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. However, I do believe that we're serving a God who understands and who believes that we're living in a day that we have to keep up with the gospel in the generation that we're living in. So my granddaddy wouldn't shave on Sunday. My grandmother wouldn't cook on Sunday. My granddaddy wouldn't wear a tie. My granddaddy wouldn't chew chewing gum because the dentist told me to rot his teeth out. So many things that we brought along as tradition and we use them as judgments against people. One of the most recent ones has been how people come to church that are unsaved. Now, yesterday I went to a church and after church I went out to dent lunch and while I was having lunch, somebody that I had seen in church Face-wise, I saw their face. I didn't see their attire. I saw their face. And this person sat down in a booth in a restaurant, and she had on way too little clothes. I mean, way too little clothes. Short shorts. I mean, I didn't see it in church. I just saw her face. But so my first judgment is she needs to go and put some clothes on. But in reality... She, that may have been the first time she'd ever been to church. She may have come just like she was. She may have come looking for Jesus and not judgment. So my generation of people, it's been so easy for us to judge people with tattoos or piercings or longer hair or facial hair or you name it. You know, you could just go down the list of all the things that, you know, the 600 and whatever rules it is that we try to live by in the old, old law, but we need to make sure that one of our adversaries is not preserving things of the past that have no value in the kingdom today. I could give you illustration after illustration of the Old Testament. I'm just telling you that we need to not get hung up on the preservation of the past. Now, a couple of years ago, um, I was in a church, and maybe 10 years ago, maybe not two years ago, but several years ago, and they had had a nativity scene on the communion table for the last 30 years. Same nativity scene, same table, same everything. And they decided to let somebody in a new generation decorate the church for Christmas. 
And so they felt like that the nativity scene would be more appealing if it was in the hot lobby where people could walk in and see it and even maybe take a picture. And it almost caused a church split. I'm telling you, it was unbelievable. Unbelievable. People were getting ready to leave the church over where the nativity is. This is where it's always been. Why would you want to move it? Please explain to me the value of that. There is none other than that's the way we've always done. That's the Sunday school class I've always gone to. Um, and so uh, it, it goes a long ways. I'm just telling you, it goes a long ways. We love to put people's names on stained glass windows. We love to put people's names on the pews. We love to put people's names in the back of a hymnal. We like to give people recognition and preserve their name after they're gone because they helped us get to where we are. Jesus brought us from where we were to where we are. And Jesus is going to get us from where we are to where we're supposed to be. Not grandma. Grandma's gone. Grandpa's gone. So I just want to ask you to be careful not to be hung up on preservation. And then the last one is scary. Potential. I just want to make this statement, and I hope you write it down and you call me and want to talk about it. There is a huge biblical difference between potential and purpose. You might have the potential to swim across the ocean, but there may be no purpose in you doing that. God has a purpose for every single one of us. Jesus came to this earth for a purpose. One purpose in mind, and that was to die for the sins of the world. While he was here, he had the potential to make significant teachings and monumental things happen, miracles happen, all, but his purpose... We have to be careful that we don't get hung up on our potential and lose sight of our purpose. My purpose, I got to tell you, I got it wrong years ago. I thought that in 1977, 78, 79, 80, when I was pastoring the church, that I was always going to be a pastor. When that didn't work out just like I had it planned, had it preserved in my mind, it caused me a huge adversarial place in my life that drove me in a different direction. If I would have remembered what my purpose was and not what my potential was, and I just want to encourage us today to, to think about the adversaries that are there in the midst of the fact that there's been a wide door of opportunity open. We believe at R3 Ministries that we have been given an incredible opportunity, a wide door of opportunity, that we can make a significant difference in the hearts and lives of pastors and their families. It seems like to me for the last couple of three weeks, I've been going to church about four nights a week, which is good. I probably need it more than most people. But uh, I went to an event on Saturday night um, and it was at a, a musician um, who have, came out of the Jesus Revolution. And she had this incredible musical potential. She could write music. She could tell a story with a guitar. She had, she had traveled the world, um, been very successful in, in music all over the country and, and very famously known, I guess, to some circles. But I sat down beside of a man and woman that I did not know, obviously, but I saw that they had on the decorative collars that some clergy wear. Um, and so I introduced myself, and I said, my name is Miles, and I said, don't think I know you guys. Where are y'all from? We're from the beach. And, and I said, um, what, do you mind if I ask you your your collar there? Are you Lutheran, Episcopalian, or, or Wesleyan? And they said, no, we're Anglican. Well, I got to tell you, I don't even know what Anglicans believe. I'm just, I mean, I've never heard anybody say they were Anglican. Or, but we sat beside each other during this hour, hour and a half of worship. 
and it was great. I mean, it was great. I kept noticing that they were worshiping in their own way. I mean, but they were very in, into the music. They were very smiling, kind. They were just, seemed like to me, they were very connected to the music. So I asked them, I said, um, do you mind telling me a little bit about the Anglican Church at an intermission? And the conversation came up about that the wife teaches the fivefold ministry and the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, signs and wonders, miracles following, and they do that in the Anglican Church. I thought, well, that sounds very Pentecostal to me. I mean, hey, that's pretty good. So he, he sent me a message yesterday and said he invite, enjoyed our conversation, and he said, we invited the lady to come to our church Sunday morning because she was leaving from the airport at Myrtle Beach, and he said she had a powerful sermon and message and song about her purpose in life. I thought her purpose was music. I just thought, man, this lady's got this musical, I mean, she could, I'm telling you, it was crazy how she could play the guitar. She lost her, she lost a very young child as a young mother, and she never grieved. She lost her husband five years ago, and she went through some dark grieving times in her life. And her purpose, she discovered, was was that she needed to help people deal with grief. So she's written a book, she's writing some new music, um, and she is realizing that her potential was great in music, but maybe her purpose was more than music. So the question we need to ask ourselves is this, what is our purpose? Are we doing what we're doing for popularity? If we are, that's an adversary. If we're doing it because we want to be recognized or we want to be popular or we want to be all this other kind of stuff, we're only hurting ourselves. But it's very important, I think, that we know and we remember that there's adversaries in the middle of, in the middle of opportunity. And if we're not careful, we will miss the opportunity because we get distracted by the adversary. One scripture says, I tried to do good, but evil was present. I tried to do good, and evil was present. Let's use this illustration in closing. Jesus is hanging on the cross. There's a guy on the left and a guy on the right. One guy says, if you are who you say you are, why don't you call down legions of angels and why don't you rescue us and get us down off this cross? Now, Jesus' potential was he could have done that. He could have just wiped it all out. He could have killed everybody, started back from scratch. He could have, he could have just took the crosses down, pulled the nails out, fixed the holes in the hands and the feet, fattened everybody up. Everybody runs in the woods and, and goes crazy. He could have done all that. He could have called down 10,000 legions of angels. He had the potential to do that. But that was not his purpose. His purpose was to hang on that cross and to not die, but to surrender his life. He was not killed. He surrendered his life. The other guy said, if you will, remember me in paradise. And Jesus said, this day you will be with me in paradise. So what is our purpose? I believe that the window, the door of opportunity is swinging broad and often among us. Someone recently said to me about being in a hallway full of doors. And if you can imagine being in a long corridor with all kinds of doors, and you were told to just pick a door, pick a door. And while you're waiting to pick a door, you're anxious, you're aggravated, you're undecided, you're all this kind of stuff. 
One writer said, just enjoy the purpose of waiting in the hallway. Just wait in the hallway. Because there's value in waiting in the hallway. I also read something recently that said, don't be intimidated by the first step on the stairs. There's a handrail there. You'll be okay. So I think it's important that we trust our anointing. We know whose we are. We know why we are. We know what he called us. We know what his purpose in us is. And don't follow the trends of popularity. Don't chase every running rabbit. Don't follow people just because they're going somewhere. Sometimes you might just need to go off on your own ordained anointed path and God is leading you into something new. I want to encourage us tonight to be faithful. To be faithful to what God has called us to do. I look behind me as you look behind me and you see this incredible piece of property. Many of you look at it and say, boy, there's so much work to be done. I wish that we could share with you in a photo gallery of what we have done, what we saw when we first got here, and the amount of things that have been done. And hopefully Justin can kind of put together a little slideshow that will really show you that God gave us a vision, and he gave us the provision, and he said for us to follow him. So we know what our purpose is. Popularity says hire somebody or do, do something different. That's, I'm just not going to do that. I'm not worried about what everybody has done in the past. I'm not trying to build a monument to anybody. I'm just doing exactly what God called me to do. And when my time is up, God's purpose for this has never changed and will not change. I believe this in my heart. In 1898, when this house was started, God had intentions for it to be a place for ministers and their families to come and take a break from life, to take a break from the stress, take a break from the discouragement, heal their wounds, and to leave here charged and encouraged and focused and have a fresh anointing on them that they will say, I'm going back to do what God called me to do. I'm not trying to be popular. I'm just going to do it. In closing, there was a story shared last night about um, the Lord said to a pastor, um, I want you to stop having Wednesday night service. Then you say, well, I don't believe that. Well, that's okay. You don't have to. But if you listen to the whole story, they changed their Wednesday night program. And instead of having a one-place assembly, they started having groups of people scattered around multiple communities in and around town and their Wednesday night growth now almost exceeds what their Sunday morning has in total. You say, well, God wants us to be in church on Wednesday night. That is tradition. That is bringing along preservation because we've always done that. Well, if that's the case, God wants us in church Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Monday, you know, right on and right on. So who says who's right and who's wrong? I do know this. The doors of opportunity are open, and there are adversaries out there. Father, thank you for your revealing word and that the, the, the truth as we see it opens our eyes. And when our eyes are opened, it allows us to see more opportunities greater vision, more specific instructions as we just focus on following you. As you said to, Paul said to them in the current church, he said, I don't want to just pass through. I want to come and I want to spend some time with you. So Father, help us to be patient. Help us to lay down our traditions that are not worthy of carrying along. Help us to shy away from trying to do what's popular and help us to focus on our purpose, not just our potential. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What an awesome, awesome setting, man. I'm just telling you, if, if, I, could, if I could describe it to you, I would. 
but the sun's setting behind the little church, the birds are chirping, the grass is green, the breeze is blowing, the leaves are falling, and it's just an incredible place. And our heart is, is that ministers and their family will be able to come and sit in a chair like this and just enjoy this, what God's created and gifted us. So we're praying for your pastors. We want, to, we want you to pray for your pastor. We want you to let your pastor know that we're here for them. And if we can help you with your church or your pastor in any way, please just call us. Let us know. You'll see a bunch of information at the end here with the app, with the website, with some pictures. You'll see it all. We just want you to get a vision. God bless you. Have a great evening. Join us next week. I'm Justin Williamson with R3 Ministries. Hope you guys are having a wonderful day. We are here for the health and restoration of pastors and clergy. These men and women from all over the world need a connection. They need a place of comfort to land when they've been beat up and taken abuse by the call. Our vision is to be a refuge for the shepherds, these folks who are serving in the front lines of ministry. This is that shelter, Shepherd's Haven, a historic home that we are restoring for God's glory in this purpose. We would ask you to consider a donation or even becoming a supporting partner of our three ministries. These gifts are fully tax deductible and every cent will go towards the restoration and operation of Shepherd's Haven. We value every penny of your ability. No amount is too small. You can find more information on Shepherd's Haven at www.r3ministriesinc. We look forward to connecting with you, speaking with you about how your involvement can go to further this goal. Thank you so much.